Hi, Hi, Yoka. Hi, Mike. Good to see you. Good to see you. I also spoke with Yoka Ardite Rocha, the executive director of the Clio Institute at the Aspen Ideas Climate Gathering. So, Yoka, the Clio Institute, uh, can you tell us what the mission is and, and how it came about? Yeah. So, the Clio Institute was founded by a science teacher, which um, about 13 years ago started to listen to the local scientific community um, telling her about the urgency of the of the climate and the the scientists were telling her you need to educate the community you need to get the community prepared and so she decided to do what she knew best which was education she thought um, if you ever meet her she'll tell you that she thought in six months she was gonna solve the issue uh, you know, fast forward 13 years um, till now, the Clio Institute is a, is a nonprofit that works throughout the entire state of Florida, headquartered here in Miami, that works with a top down and a bottom up approach, working with really the frontline communities that are already experiencing the brunt of the, of the climate crisis, and then with top uh, elected officials at the local level and, and Tallahassee, and then everybody in between, business community, uh, faith-based community, schools, academia. Um, we talk to anybody that, that is willing to listen. And so we do that with um, a programmatic lens, but also with a, an advocacy uh, framework as well. You know, the solutions are there. We want to make sure people understand that there are many things that we could do at an individual or collective um, way. Yoka is working with policymakers and stakeholders to build climate resilience and mobilize climate action through the Clio Institute. She previously was director of No Planete B and has participated in the UN climate negotiation conferences of parties. Willing to listen, uh, three very important words. Um, and uh, I'm sure there was a reluctance early on. Do you still run up against that? I do, we do, but very minimal though. Um, the majority, this, uh, the majority of Floridians already see uh, a changing climate in real time. Um, so that gap has really closed up in the last few years. Mother Nature has been very convincing with the extreme weather events we have been experiencing. I mean, just the last four days here in Miami, we have broke broken heat records. So. Um, we, we do find eventually here and there people that are skeptical um, or people that are just not willing to, to listen or, or not willing to accept the science as we have seen in, in some parts of our, of our country. Front lines, you, you mentioned talking to Tallahassee, that's the politicians, but the front lines I suspect uh, have stories to tell. What are you hearing from them? We hear so many stories, um, people that are really struggling to put food on the table, uh, especially exacerbated by the pandemic, um, that sometimes need to choose between food on the table or paying their energy bill. Um, the majority of Miami-Dade County residents um, are considered uh, income constrained or working poor. And so we're talking about 65% of Miami-Dade County residents that lack those safety nets um, that they need to cope with increasing extreme weather events like extreme heat, for example. So there are many, many, we, we, you know, we hear from community members that have mold inside their home, facing tremendous respiratory illnesses, chronic asthma, um, workers from our agriculture land, facing extreme heat conditions and not having able to choose whether to stop working or not, or not getting the much needed water breaks that they need because of extreme uh, increasing temperatures. So the, the stories are many. Um, this is uh, a much relevant issue for, for many Floridians. And this part of uh, the United States uh, has, has always seen extreme weather events, but they've gotten uh, more problematic over the years, haven't they? Absolutely. I mean, we've always had hurricanes. We've had stream, um, we have had heat waves in the past. We've have had wildfires in the past and, and so many other related issues. What climate does, or, or a changing climate or warming climate does, is really exacerbate those, um, making them a lot worse, a lot more damaging, a lot more catastrophic, a lot more um, really life-threatening in, in many ways. Hurricanes now 
I intensify much, much faster because of our warming waters of our ocean. And so we have, not only are they intensifying faster, they're lingering longer. They're staying above communities for up to two days. If you can remember, uh, uh, the, bah the, the Bahamas um, really experienced a two-day hurricane, catastrophic category five hurricane on top of them for 48 hours. So that is um, all produced by a warming climate. Same thing would happen with Hurricane Harvey in Texas. It really linger a lot more than normally they do. Um, and so we have never been strangers to hurricane here in South Florida. I grew up in the Caribbean. I, I grew up with hurricanes, but now they're definitely getting much more bigger faster and they're much more catastrophic. 13 million people in the U.S. could experience six feet of sea level rise by the year 2100. Of those 13 million, nearly 25 percent live in Florida. As climate change threatens communities, properties become less valuable based on their capacity to adjust to rapid sea level rise. These changes in price drive development companies to displace existing lower-income residents, a phenomenon known as climate gentrification. Yoko, I was looking at your bio and it says you're an Al Gore trained speaker. So what does that mean exactly? And, and what's your thoughts about Al Gore? Because he was really kind of out there in the forefront. That film made a big difference, didn't it? It did. It did made, it, it actually prompted me to become really active in, in this issue. When I saw An Inconvenient Truth, I was able to connect many dots, and it was my aha moment. So I think Al Gore has been um, really a catalyst of, of, of many activists who understood that invisible threat, um, as we know climate crisis can be. And so I, when I started connecting those dots, I understood that I, as a human, was part of that problem. And so I decided to become part of the solution, and. Um, enrolled in one of his trainings and became certified as a, as a climate speaker. And then from then on, I kept on working and going, <laughs> like the Energizer Bunny. <laughs> you mentioned climate gentrification for our viewers. What, what, what is that? Climate gentrification is, is, is basically neighborhoods being gentrified because of some related impact due to climate. And here in Miami-Dade County, we've been seeing that in different parts where elevation has become uh, the commodity and pushing communities of color, low-income communities that have settled in the highest part of the county being pushed away by big development um, projects that are looking for higher ground. Um, it's, it's definitely something that continues to be studied, but that we have seen in different parts of, of our county in the past years. There's a documentary out. I'm going to close with this. Uh, it just came to mind when you were talking about this. There was a documentary out, I think maybe 10 years ago, called Climate Refugees, and kind of focused on the same thing, but more of a global context that it's, it, you know, you talk about income inequality, that, that that's the group that's going to get hammered the most with climate as well, and they're going to have to be forced from their homes, and, and this is what you're describing. Can you talk about how income inequality factors into the climate crisis? Yeah, and it is not a, a, a thing of the future. It's happening now. We're definitely seeing the disparities that have been settling in our communities um, for so many years become exacerbated by a warming climate, whether it's gender inequality, whether it's racial inequality, whether it's social and in economic inequality. Those uh, injustices are really making the issue a lot worse. And so to talk about just gender inequality, for example, women tend to be disproportionately burdened by a warming climate, not only here in our country, but all over the world as well. Um, same thing with um, you know, racial inequality. Communities of color have traditionally for many, many years become um, disposable in some ways for our environmental pollution. And so those continue to be on the front lines of, of the climate crisis and, and experiencing the brunt and the worst of it. 
You kind of never want to see anybody lose their job, but I'm with you. If you can get done soon, move to another career, I think we'll all be happy. Uh, thank you so much for the work that you're doing and for the time you've spent with us. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I also hope that I can be without a job soon. <laughs> thank you.